Hello and very welcome to the second lecture in the module Postgraduate Dynamics with the acronym MSD780. Today we will look at the what I call a pendulum rod and I'll show you in a minute uh, an animation of what the rod looks like and how it moves. My name is Dr. Lucas de Plessis. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering at the University of Pretoria. So what you see on the screen, if I can just move this a little bit, um, the pendulum is pivoting about this point and this is purely an animation. Um, so you get the idea. Very simple mechanism. So let's see how will we analyze this um, this mechanism. All right. So, firstly, let us quickly. I'm just going to move this back. All right. So, if we draw a schematic of the um, pendulum rod, it will look something like what you see on the on the screen. This is a hand draw hand drawn sketch. So, not very neat. I didn't use rulers or anything. But I think you'll get the idea. All right. So um, the pendulum rod is pivoting about this point A. And that's also the origin of the XY coordinate system as well as the C eta coordinate system. All right. So the XY coordinate system um, is stationary and the C eta coordinate system rotates with the body, right? And you'll see in a minute why I actually chose to uh, create the coordinate systems like I've done. All right, the mass, the center of mass is um, half the length away from the pivot, pivoting point. Um, this is the mass times gravitational acceleration. Um, the pendulum makes an angle theta with the vertical axis and the positive direction is counterclockwise. And so we can divide the weight or mass times acceleration into its two components. Uh, mass times gravitational acceleration times the sine of the angle theta and the, the component parallel to the eta axis is mass times gravitational acceleration times the cosine of the angle theta. Okay, for our initial condition, where the pendulum, in other words, will start, uh, theta is 60 degrees, the mass of the pendulum is 2 kilogram, and the length is 0 0.6 meter. Right, so with that done, we can if I can just zoom out a little bit, we can take the sum of moments about point A um, and that will be equal to the moment of inertia of the pendulum rod about point A multiplied by the angular acceleration theta double dot. Okay, and for our sign convention, counterclockwise is positive. Okay, so if we do that, um, you, it's easy to see that the this component of the weight mass times gravitational acceleration times sine theta is the only force that is acting um, perpendicular to the um, moment arm the moment arm is l over 2 so and this moment if we multiply this component of the of the weight with the moment arm is obviously a, will create a moment in the in the clockwise direction, so it will be negative. That's why we say uh, minus mass times gravitational acceleration times sine of the angle theta times the moment arm L over 2, and that equals this moment of inertia about point A, which is 1 over 3 times the mass times the length squared. Okay? Uh, multiplied by theta double dot. The double dot is not that clear on this image, but uh, that's what we've uh, written here. Right, so if we then rearrange and if we eliminate, um, for example, mass, we eliminate this 
L, this length over here. And we rearrange the terms, we get an expression for uh, the angular acceleration, theta double dot equals minus gravitational acceleration times sine of theta divided by 2 times the length. And if we substitute the values in, we get the angular acceleration as minus 21,239 and I've reported it here as radians per second square. Radians per second, not degrees per second square, but radians per second square. Alright, so we can then carry on. Uh, if I can just zoom out a little bit more. So, in order to... Th that's... that's um, or this analysis gives us, as, as you know, and as you can see, the angular acceleration. What if we are interested in what the reaction forces here at point A are? What, what do we do then? Okay, so what we can do is we can say we take some of the forces in the C direction and that will be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the C direction. Alright, so if we do that, okay, and I haven't drawn it in here, if I can just zoom out a little bit more. Right, so, and maybe I can move this away. Right, so we can say it's not drawn in the free body diagram, but assume there's a reaction force in the positive C direction acting at location A on the pendulum rod. Okay, so this is this capital N C minus and minus this component of the uh, weight, this component, mass times gravitational acceleration times sine theta. Okay, those are the forces acting in the C direction and that will be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the C direction. And since it is rotating about point A, to get the acceleration, the tangential acceleration of the pendulum rod, we take the length, this radius, this radius of rotation, L over 2, multiplied by the um, angular acceleration theta double dot. Okay, and that's our first equation. We indicate it with the number 1. Okay. Now, the, for the second um, equation, we take the sum of moments about point B. Okay. And that will then be equal to the moment of inertia of the pendulum rod about point B. Okay. And I just want to pause here for a minute. The moment of inertia of this slender rod, if we calculate it about point A, will be different from the moment of inertia of this slender rod or pendulum rod if we calculate it about point B. Okay, so just take note of that. Some of the moments about point B will be equal to the moment of inertia of the pendulum rod about point B multiplied by the angular acceleration theta double dot. And as before, our sign convention is positive in a counterclockwise direction. Right, so, okay, I can zoom out a little bit more. Right, so, um, remember, um, we have the reaction force in C acting in the positive C direction. Right, so if, if we, uh, we are now looking at the sum of moments about point B, so this, the moment that will be as a result of this reaction force is then obviously also in the negative direction since the, the reaction force we've chosen to be in the positive C direction. So you can clearly see that that moment will um, try to rotate the pendulum rod in a clockwise direction, which is negative. So that's why we've got minus N C times the moment arm, L over 2. And now this is the difference now. The moment, the moment of inertia 
of the pendulum rod about point B is 1 over 12 times the mass times the length of the rod, uh, pendulum rod squared multiplied by the angular acceleration. So it's a 12 ml squared where the previous moment of inertia was 1 over 3 times the mass times the length squared. Okay, so that's the difference. It's important to note that. That's our second equation. And now we simply do um, rearrangement of terms. We isolate this reaction force N C, okay, from equation 2. And we get um, the right hand side as indicated here. And this is our equation 3 then. Then we substitute the value for this reaction force into equation 1. Okay, and what that enables, allows us to do then is to, um, once again, rearranging the terms, eliminating and simplifying the, the equation. And we get an expression for theta double dot uh, as minus 3g sine, over, sine of theta over 2l. And this corresponds exactly to what we've obtained previously when uh, we took the moment, sum of moments about point A. Okay, so just also a, another thing to note, um, it's a bit abstract, but regardless of where you take the moments, the angular acceleration, theta double dot of this pendulum rod will, will be the same, theta double dot. Okay, so that's just a side note. Okay, so what we can then do is we can substitute this um, equation that we have for theta double dot or the angular acceleration into equation 3 um, and that will then give us um, yeah that will then give us the uh, simplified equation for the reaction force in the C direction we can substitute the values and we get 4,25 Newton. Okay. Um, the reaction force in the eta direction, if I can just scroll, if you can just have a look here, that's mass times gravitational acceleration times the cosine of theta. Um, why, do, why is it like that? Um, that's simply because um, in the eta direction there's no acceleration. This or no movement in that direction. This pendulum rod pivots about point A. So hence we can say some of the forces in the eta direction equals zero. All right. So there's uh, once again an imaginary. I did not indicate it here, but there's the reaction force in the eta direction, positive eta direction. The only uh, force or comp yeah force in the eta direction acting on the pendulum rod is this component of the weight so mass times gravitational acceleration times cosine theta so um, taking some of the, the forces in the eta direction we can clearly see that this reaction force will be equal to the component of weight that we've uh, calculated or what that we've indicated on this free body diagram Right, that's what that is, and then we by substituting the values, we get um, a value for the reaction force in the eta direction. Now we can then very easily uh, calculate the reaction forces in the x and y directions. This is just trigonometry. Okay, so what I'm doing here is. Um, We've calculated the reaction force in the eta and in the, or sorry in the C and the eta directions, and we can then henceforth using trigonometry also calculate what are the components of the reaction forces in the x and y directions, and you will see later on in this lecture why um, I've done that. So previously I've indicated that we will be using planar multibody dynamics in this module, the second edition. The author is Professor Parvitz Nikraves from the University of Arizona. So if you go to the publisher website, um, 
and you scroll down all the way to the bottom, you will notice that there are support materials, or material rather, Appendix B, Appendix C, and then um, this DAP BC11 uh, zip file. Now this is the MATLAB code for the um, algorithm that Professor Nikravesh developed. Okay, so if you've downloaded the zip folder, you unextracted it, um, you can run the code, the MATLAB code. I use Octave, which is an open source uh, software package. Um, you can then use your file browser option here and go to the folder where you have copied and extracted your um, the the zip folder that you've downloaded from the publisher website okay now the uh, the important thing to do now is to go to this models subfolder and with the zip folder that you've extracted you will see that there are a number of existing models already uh, as part of the uh, algorithm that Professor Nikravesh developed. Okay, so what you can do is simply uh, take one of those, any one of those folders, uh, make a copy of it, and then edit the input files. The, the way that the algorithm runs is using input files. Okay, now I've already copied um, and created a, another folder or a, for, for the pendulum rod that we are about to analyze. So I just use an acronym PR for pendulum rod and this is the second revision of the pendulum rod that I have on my computer and that's what the B is there for. Okay, so previously we've looked at this uh, free body diagram, the schematic of which is shown on the screen. And uh, I just want to point out, um, we've selected the global coordinate system X, Y as coinciding with point A. And we've selected this C eta coordinate system also co coinciding with A, but orientated um, in accordance to the orientation of um, this pendulum rod. Okay. So what we will do now is define this mechanism inside uh, Nikravesh's algorithm, MATLAB algorithm. Um, and what I recommend you do is to create a sketch of your mechanism. All right, I've already done that for this mechanism. Right, and this will look like this. So, as before, we have the global coordinate system coinciding with the um, with this pivot point. Okay, but what is different is now the C eta coordinate system is located at the center of gravity of the pendulum rod and obviously also orientated in accordance to the orientation of the the body okay this is this is very important uh, whenever you uh, specify a mechanism and we'll look at other examples as well the local what Nikravesh refers to as the local coordinate system is always fixed to the body at the center of gravity the orientation you can you can choose how you want to orientate it usually as is the case with this um, pendulum rod um, it it makes sense for one of these two axes to be aligned with the length of the rod okay but you can choose you can choose it arbitrarily the location of the global coordinate system can also be anywhere on the mechanism the way we've defined it, it this is a logical choice for the global coordinate system 
all right we'll get to these points one two and three in a little bit okay so um let's look at the the input files individually okay so the first one and this is now in alphabetic order the first one is in animate okay so um you have the option and we'll look at that later on to specify animation points okay for this example i've selected not to do so you could have done it but i've selected not to do so but what is important is the variables for defining the 3d animation axes uh, used by the plot system okay now let me just explain why i selected x min as minus one x max as plus one y min as minus one and y max as comma two okay so if we go back to yes i think this sketch will work right so we know the length of the pendulum is 0 0,6 meter or 600 millimeters okay so for our animation window it makes sense to have a value x max greater than 600 x min smaller than minus 600 y min smaller than minus 600 and y max can be anything arbitrarily okay so uh, that's why i've selected uh, one as x max minus one as x min minus one as y min and 0 0,2 as y max okay that's the first input file now the second input file is very important uh, function in bodies All right so the, you will list all the bodies that make up your uh, mechanism excluding ground ground is body zero in necrovicious algorithm All right so this first line you will uh, leave unedited now the next few lines that's where we enter the parameters relating to our body okay so the very first one is mass and that's two kilograms if you remember i can just show you so our mass is two kilogram um yes the other important thing is the moment of inertia now the moment of inertia is taken about the center of gravity that's very important not about the pivot point about the center of gravity and if you remember what i showed you earlier is this will now if i can just zoom out a little bit so this will be this i subscript b okay which is evaluated or calculated using 1 over 12 ml squared okay that's the moment of inertia we have to enter in the MATLAB file all right this is the second one j b1.j and if you calculate it for those values that we've specified it's 0 0.06 kilogram meter squared uh, Nikravish's algorithm uses SI units so mass in kilogram length in meter moment of inertia in kilogram meter squared angles in radians okay and we'll get to that also in a little bit the next parameter is b1.r now that is the initial x and y coordinates of the center of gravity of the body all right let me repeat it's the x and y coordinates of the center of gravity of the body initial initially at time t zero okay so how did i get to this value well i've created a free cad schematic or sketch um, that's what you see on the screen over here so it's very simple to see uh, the length of the pendulum rod the center of gravity is in the in the middle of the pendulum rod so that's 300 millimeters from the top 
The initial angle is 30 degrees and we'll enter that in a minute. But the parameters that we are now interested in is the X and Y dimensions or coordinates of the center of gravity. And in FreeCAD, it's the, our units are millimeters, degree, degrees, kilogram, etc. Millimeters and not meters. So when you enter or copy this value and paste it into the um, MATLAB file, you have to adjust the position of the decimal. All right, and that's exactly what I've done. So 259,808 in our MATLAB file is 0 0.259808 meters. And this minus 0 0.15, if you go to um, our free cat, that's 150 millimeters, it's minus. Okay, so just going back here, the X value is positive, but the Y value is negative. It's in this direction. It is below the zero point. Okay. So that's uh, what I've done there. Now the initial angle, that's B1.P, um, and that's minus pi over 6. Okay, so Nikravesh's sign convention for angles is we start at the positive x-axis and we measure positively in a counterclockwise direction. So in this case, our initial angle is measured or is 30 degrees measured from the horizontal x-axis in a clockwise direction which is negative okay so that's why we enter uh, in the mat or in the matlab file minus pi over six and that is obviously the radian value of the orientation we cannot enter degrees here so that's the orientation of body one right then the next parameter is the initial velocities or the x and y components of the initial velocity of the center of gravity of body one okay and in our case it's zero the the, the pendulum rod starts from rest and then pivots okay so it's zero the two components each of them will also be zero right then we just end off with this line bodies equal b1 if our mechanism had more than one body then we would obviously have a, a list a complete list of all the bodies that define our mechanism right that's in bodies so the next matlab input file is in forces and for our mechanism, we will only specify weight. This is the standard way of doing it in uh, Nikravesh's algorithm. And we obviously list then only S1. That's the only force that we have. We will in later examples look at other standard forces that we can define. The next MATLAB input function is in funks. Okay, and in this example, it's empty. We will, in later examples, look at how we utilize this, these input files or input functions. Right, so the next input file is very important, in joints. Okay, um, there is, as you already know, and I can jump back quickly, there is for our mechanism only a single joint, this uh, pin or revolute joint. It's also referred to in some uh, sources as an as a hinge, okay, or a pin joint, as I said earlier. So that's the only joint we need to define, okay. And the way we do that in Nikravesh's algorithm um, is as follows: um, the type is defined as a revolute joint or REV for short, and uh, we specify two points in order to uh, define the revolute joint okay now you will notice here j1 ip index is 1 and j1 j jp index 
is 2. Now those indices refer to the next input file in points. Okay, and we'll go there in a minute. Obviously, for this very simple mechanism, our joints list only has one entry. Okay, so now let's look at points 1 and 2 in order to understand how did we define uh, the revolute joint of our mechanism. Okay, so in, in points, um, what I've done is I've specified three points. Okay, you could have gotten away by specifying only two points, but I have done so specifying a third point because that makes the animation then a little bit more easy to understand. Okay, so let me quickly show you. Okay, so points one and two is at this revolute joint. Okay, point three is at the end of the pendulum rod. The difference between points one and two is that point one is defined on ground, okay, and point two is defined on the pendulum rod, which is our body one. Ground is body zero, pendulum rod is body one. Let me show you. So, point P1 is on ground, body 0, and it is at local coordinates 0, 0. So, for ground, the local coordinates um, correspond to the global coordinates because ground only has um, a single coordinate system which is the global coordinate system, the global XY coordinate system. And the way we've selected at the start is that our global coordinate system coincides with this pivot point or revolute joint. So those coordinates, those coordinates or local coordinates on ground of point 1 is, or, or are rather, 0, 0. Okay, I'm not, English is not my first language, so please excuse me if I make the odd or not so odd grammar mistake. Right, so those coordinates are 0, 0 um, for ground. Uh, sorry, for point P1 on ground. Now, point P2 is on body 1. The pendulum rod and the local coordinates of point one sorry of point p2 on body one are minus 0, 0,3 0. How did we get that? If we look at our sketch, it's very simple to see. Uh, this is our C axis, our eta axis. So the local coordinate of point p2 on this body is at local coordinates minus 0, 0,3 and in the eta direction 0. Right. And similarly, point 3 is then at local coordinates 0, 0,3 in body 1 in the C direction, the eta direction is 0. So that's how that is uh, defined. Okay. And then here you can see a nice example. We've got three points. So our points list contains three entries. Very simple. The last input file is in U vectors. And for this example that we are considering at the moment, it will be an empty list. All right. So with that done, we are now ready to run the... Um, the animation. Okay, so to do that, you go to the command window here at the bottom and you type in DAP. Okay, now it asks if I can just move my which container contains or which folder rather contains the model. Okay, and what we have is PR for pendulum rod. And this is our second iteration. Okay, so I will in PR subscript B. 
Okay, and now let me just move this away a bit. Do you want to correct the initial conditions? Okay, and in our case we will say yes, we do want that. Right, so here it gives you the corrected coordinates, which is 259,808, which is in any case the value that we entered as the initial conditions, minus 0, 0,15, which is correct, phi in degrees is minus 30 degrees, which is also correct. The corrected velocities, it starts at initial, at rest, initially, so 0, 0, 0. Now you can select the final time, and let's just do 3 seconds. The reporting time step, you can choose any value. Let's take 0, 0,01 or 10 milliseconds. And there we go. Right, so we have run our first simulation. Um, what we do next is we type in the word anim. Okay, let's just see. Here we go. Here's our animation. This is the initial um, orientation and position of uh, of our mechanism, or which consists only of a single body. So here you can now see the the screen that we've defined for the animation. X max at one. X min at minus one y max at comma 2, y min at minus 1. Okay, and now it asks us to press any key. I just need to fiddle around with it a little bit. No. There we go. Right, so there you can see how the pendulum swings. Okay. for the duration that we specified. The other thing that while it's, while it's um, swinging, here you can now see that that point 3 that we've defined is, uh, it's nice to have it in the animation. Okay, and the way that I've defined point 3, uh, the animation, or, the, or let me put it this way, the animation draws lines connects the lines, connects the points to the center of gravity. That's what it does. Okay, so point P2 is connected to the center of gravity with a line, and point P3 is connected to the center of gravity also with a line. That's how the animation works. Right, so very nice. We've got the video, or the animation rather. Now, let us now see if our simulation actually calculated the reaction forces correctly. Right, and the way you do that is you enter post. Post then, here in the workspace, creates the Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so if I click on that, then you can see here, initially, at point T0, or let me just show you, if I scroll down all the way to the end, there will be 301 entries. Okay, at time t0, and all the way in increments of 10 milliseconds, all the way to time t3, or 3 seconds. So, um, that's why there are 301 entries. Now, the Lagrange multipliers are the reaction forces in the x, y, uh, directions global x y coordinates okay now what I want to show you now is if we go back to this okay so if we go back to our analytical calculation um, I showed you that I've calculated the uh, reaction force in the x direction as minus 6,37 newton and in the y direction as 8,58 and you can automatically see or immediately see this is exactly the same as the Lagrange multipliers that Nick Ravish's 
algorithm calculates. Okay, the sign is different, but the magnitudes are exactly the same. And the sign convention is simply a matter of what I calculated was the yes was the reaction force on the pendulum rod. Okay, what the Lagrange multipliers calculate is the is the um, force that the pendulum rod converts or applies rather to the pin joint okay which is then this direction 6.37 newton and in the y in the negative y direction 8.5 eight three seven okay but it really doesn't matter what we are more interested in is obviously the uh, the magnitude of the resultant reaction force on the pin joint okay and that is simply calculated by taking the square root of the sum of squares of these two values so then a plus or minus will have no influence but the, obviously the magnitudes are very important and that corresponds exactly to our analytical calculation so this this thing clearly shows even for this very simple example the power of the simulation of the general purpose um, computer algorithm that prof nikravesh developed um, we, are, we now have the reaction forces at each time instant for the duration of the simulation. Okay, so what you see on the screen here, I've just copied and paste, pasted the values that Nikravesh's algorithm calculated. I've added the resultant force or the magnitude of the resultant force. I calculated that using the sum of squares. Or the square root of the sum of squares and what you see here on the right uh, is a plot of the um, reaction forces the x component y component and as well as the resultant force and with this information for this very simple example we can then very successfully select the, an appropriate bearing for our mechanism so what we can also find from the um, MATLAB algorithm that Nikravis wrote are the coordinates in other words well the coordinates of the mechanism of each body in the mechanism um, and I will explain what that means in a minute so the the specific variables that we are interested in are um, variables R which are if you click on them um, if I can just move this away so um, this is the x these are the x coordinates for body 1 at each time instant followed by if we scroll down the y coordinates at each time instant of body 1 um, so uh, yes uh, let me just also show you that r the, the parameter r then P is the orientation angle of body 1. Alright, so if we double click that, make it bigger, uh, then you can see at each time instant, and this is in radians, um, the, at each time instant the orientation angle of body 1. So what I've done is I've copied um, all the values, if I can just show you, so I've copied the X and Y coordinates, I've rearranged them so that they fit into our table and I've also copied and pasted the um, orientations and converted them from radians to degrees. And uh, what that allows us to do, if we just consider the X and Y coordinates, uh, we can trace the path that the C of G or the center of gravity follows and as you can see this is um, it varies along the x-axis and y-axis 
and it uh, intersects the y-axis at minus 0 0.3 as expected. Um, similarly, we can plot the x and y coordinates as well as the orientation phi as uh, against time and this is the sinusoidal behavior um, as we've expected or as we expect um, the x coordinate um, y coordinate is in red and then the angle phi is uh, indicated on the secondary y axis um, as it varies from 0 to 3 seconds so apart from the coordinates we can also get velocities x component, y component and angular velocity um, x and y are plotted against the primary y axis and the orientation or the angular velocity is plotted against the secondary y axis and this is in radians per second and similarly the MATLAB analysis also yields the um, accelerations the x and y com components of the acceleration of the center of gravity of the pendulum rod that's plotted against the primary y axis the angular acceleration in yellow is plotted against the secondary y axis in radians per second squared let me just show you how i got hold of that so um, if you in the workspace if you scroll down to um, this parameter rd that gives the x and y components of the velocities so if i scroll down the second set of 301 entries those are the y components and similarly if we could if we close this quickly and open rdd this gives the accelerations the x and y components of the acceleration of the center of gravity of the pendulum rod first the x components and uh, the second set of entries are the y components all right then uh, the the angular velocity is this parameter pd okay so if we close this quickly and i can show you so pd this is the angular velocity of the of body one which is the there is only one body of the in, and that is the pendulum rod so this gives the angular velocities at each time instant for the pendulum rod and um, PDD that gives the angular velocities angular accelerations excuse me of the pendulum rod at each time instant and this is in radians per second squared so what is noteworthy um, and this is what is expected also if we look at the acceleration or the angular acceleration and if I can just zoom in a little bit at time instant t naught um, we get the angular acceleration of minus 21,239 radians per second square and um, if I can go back to our analytical calculation that we started off with you can clearly also see here that the uh, angular acceleration is minus 21,239 radians per second square. In other words, in a clockwise direction, 21.239 radians per second square. And this corresponds exactly to what we've calculated using Nikravish's algorithm, minus 21 or 21,239 in, in a clockwise direction. I do hope that you can recognize and appreciate the value and the importance of the general purpose multi-body analysis tool that Professor Nikravesh developed. We managed to do a full dynamic analysis of this very simple mechanism. That is true, but this is just for illustrative purposes. The point is we did the full dynamic analysis of this mechanism without having had to derive all the equations or write down the equations of motion um, do the algebra do the simplification we, we didn't do any of this all we did was we entered the um, we edited the um, input files specifically in bodies uh, we specified 
weight as the only external force acting on the mechanism. We didn't have any functions. We specified the joint. Um, and obviously also points which we use to define the joint. That's all we had to do in order to do a full dynamic analysis. And these are um, the results that you can obtain from the analysis. Uh, the reaction forces, the trace of the center of gravity, the coordinates, velocities, and accelerations. Um, yes, so I, I think it's very neat and it's very elegant. And um, one can obviously, for this simple example, still successfully do the hand calculation. But once the mechanism has multiple bodies and multiple joints, doing it by hand becomes impossible. And then uh, the power of a multi or general purpose algorithm is so much more emphasized. So what I would like to do next is use the pendulum rod to explain the underlying principles behind Prof. Nikravish's, what I refer to as his body coordinate planar multi-body dynamics algorithm that we've used it's implemented in MATLAB and that's the algorithm we've used to analyze the pendulum rod as a very simple multi-body uh, system, a planar multi-body system. Okay, so to start our discussion, let's just consider the fact that Sir Isaac Newton, we all are aware of him and his three very famous laws of motion. Uh, it's interesting to note that he lived in the 1600s. He was born in 1642 and passed away in 1727 or 26, depending on which calendar you use. At that stage, there wasn't just a single calendar. There were different calendars that, was, that were used. Okay. But be that as it may, um, it's interesting to note that Newton was in his mid-40s, and at that stage, years of research culminated with his 1687 publication of Principia, a landmark work that established the universal laws of motion and gravity. Right, so how does that then apply to a planar a body moving in a plane? Okay, and this is explained in Planar Multibody Dynamics, Prof. Nikravish's textbook in section 4.3.2, uh, the title of which is Centroidal Equations of Motion. Okay, so the equation of motion for the mass center of a rigid body is directly obtained from Newton's second law as shown here in equation 4.13, whereas M is the mass of the body, R double dot is the vector of acceleration of the mass center, and F represents the vector sum of all external forces acting on the body. All right. So for planar motion, in addition to the two translational degrees of freedom that a free body exhibits in, on a plane, a free body also exhibits one rotational degree of freedom. The rotational equation of motion of a body is described here as shown here in equation 4.14, where J is the mass moment of inertia of a body about the mass center, and I'll say something more about that in a bit, Phi double dot is the angular acceleration of the body and N is the sum of all the torques and the moments of all forces with respect to the mass center that acts on the body. Let me repeat that. N is the sum of all the torques and the moments of all forces with respect to the mass center that acts on the body. Okay, so just let's just um, emphasize or elaborate a bit on what the moment of inertia is okay so throughout the planar multibody dynamics textbook prof nikravesh uses the term moment of inertia 
to refer to the mass moment of inertia about an axis perpendicular to the plane and going through the mass center and this is true unless otherwise stated. Okay, so equations 4.13 and 4.14 can be appended and put in a matrix form as shown here in equation 4.15. Okay, so if we now look at the right hand side of equation 4.15, uh, we can say where C double dot is the accentroidal array of accelerations consisting of the translational and angular accelerations. H is the centroidal array of forces consisting of the forces and the moments and couples acting on the body. And M uh, is the mass or inertia matrix. And you can see how we can express this mass or inertia matrix. Now, equation 415 is referred to as the centroidal equations of motion because the reference point on the body is its mass, mass center. In the planar multibody dynamics textbook, the term equations of motion or dynamic equilibrium equations will be used to refer to the centroidal equations of motion unless specified otherwise. So let us now answer the question, what is the influence of joints on multi-body dynamics? Okay, and this answer is obtained from planar multi-body dynamics section 4.4.2 with the title reaction forces. All right, so when kinematic joints are present in a multi-body system, we must consider their corresponding reaction forces and or torques in the equations of motion. Alright, and we'll look at the, this spin joint in a little bit. Now, Newton's third law of motion between two particles can directly be correlated with the reaction forces due to kinematic joints between two bodies. Reaction forces or torques act between two bodies along or about the axis for which no relative motion is allowed. So, in other words, we can say that a kinematic joint removes one or more of the three relative degrees of freedom between two planar bodies. The imposed restrictions on the relative motion expressed analytically are called constraints. Okay, so let us consider now the two bodies connected by a pin joint or revolute joint or hinge or pivot joint depending on how you want to express it. It's shown schematically in figure 4.10a as well as on the screen. Okay, now a pin joint allows the bodies to rotate relative to one another but it eliminates the relative translation between the attachment points along any two orthogonal axes. Now, since this joint removes two relative translations or translational degrees of freedom, the resultant reaction force on each body can be described by two orthogonal components, lambda 1 and lambda 2. And that is what is shown here on the right hand side of figure 4.10a. On the left hand side, that's the degree of freedom, the, re the relative degree of freedom between the two bodies that this pin or revolute joint allows. And what you see on the right hand side are the two components, lambda 1 and lambda 2, that act on uh, each of these two bodies. And obviously, um, the direction of lambda 1 as well as that of lambda 2 acting on body I, those directions are switched around to find the directions for lambda 1 and lambda 2 acting on body J. The magnitudes of lambda 1 in, on both bodies is exactly the same, 
and the magnitude of lambda 2 on body i and the magnitude of lambda 2 on body j is also exactly the same and this is in accordance with Newton's third law uh, which we uh, mentioned up here so let's now analyze the pendulum rod according to the free body diagram methodology explained in planar multi-body dynamics chapter 6 and this discussion we'll use what we've uh, points 1 and 2 that we've um, discussed earlier and this will lead into our explanation of the free body diagram methodology and the explanation of the free body diagram methodology will lead into the analysis of the pendulum rod according to Nikravesh's body coordinate formulation and this body coordinate formulation is what is implemented in Nikravesh's MATLAB code right so to analyze the pendulum rod according to the free body diagram it's also explained in chapter 6 in planar multibody dynamics so the pendulum rod that we are considering is schematically represented in figure 1 Okay, now note that the mass of the pendulum rod is 2 kilograms and the moment of inertia or the mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity is 0 0.06 kilogram meter squared. And there is the formula for calculating that moment of inertia as well. So in the configuration shown in figure 1, the following coordinates are provided. Okay, so we have the coordinate or the algebraic vector r superscript g subscript 1 which is the um, position vector the global position vector for the center of gravity of um, the pendulum rod which we uh, numbered as body or link 1 okay and that is 0 0.259808 in the x direction and minus 0 0.15 in the y direction and those distances are in meter okay so the free body diagram of the pendulum rod mechanism is shown in figure 2 okay so the components of the reaction force for the pin joint are marked as lambda 1 and lambda 2 in figure Two. right and here you can see uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 um, acting on the hinge that is fixed to ground and lambda 1 and lambda 2 are switched around the direction is uh, flipped around and those reaction forces are now acting on the pendulum rod also at location A Okay, so the components of the reaction force are indexed consecutively for easy reference. Okay, so the numbers itself, 1 and 2, that you can decide how you want to apply it. Okay, now based on the free body diagram of figure 2, we construct the arrays of reaction force and then the equations of motion as follows. okay so we've got our mass or inertia matrix on the left we've got the array of accelerations centroidal accelerations um, here we've got the weight acting on the right hand side is now all the forces and moments acting on the body so first of all we've got the weight acting in the negative y direction okay that's why it's here uh, in this in position number two plus and these are now the reaction forces okay so we've got lambda one in the negative x direction so minus lambda one in position one we've got minus lambda two in position two because lambda two here is acting in the negative y direction and what we have here is the moment of or the resultant moment of these two external forces about the center of gravity and we'll explain that uh, in the next line of thought 
So the reaction force from the pin joint that acts on body 1 has a moment arm S, which is indicated here as vector S superscript A subscript 1, which results in a moment in the rotational equation of this body. Okay, the components of the moment arm can be computed as, um, here you can see the, the um, well, the algebraic expression for the components of that moment arm. It's basically 0 minus R1G, um, and that will be equal to minus 0 0.25908. The x component and the y component is 0 0.15. Okay, yeah, and you can also see it geometrically as s, the vector sa1 is indicated here in the figure. Okay, but algebraically we can say it is, um, yes, 0 minus r uh, g1 as, ex as shown here. Um, in this expression. Okay, so the moment associated with the reaction force is determined as the vector product bet between S, the vector S A1 and minus lambda 1, 2. Okay, um, and we can do that, the, we can uh, expand the expression as follows. And this gives the, uh, the moment associated with that reaction force then as a moment about the z-axis. Okay, that's what this um, k hat is indicated. And here you can clearly see it is exactly the same as what is here expressed in equation 1. Okay, now in algebraic form, this cross product can be expressed as, um, and what this means is S rotated apostrophe, or the transpose of S rotated A1, multiplied by the uh, algebraic vector minus lambda 1, 2. Okay. This is the algebraic expression written out, and uh, we once again get exactly the same expression for the moment um, that the reaction forces yield. Okay, now note that S rotated A1 transposed is minus 0 0.15 minus 0 0.259808. Now that is explained over here. And you'll see in a little bit why we do this uh, in such an elaborate manner. Now, uh, consider the vector A rotated 90 degrees in the positive sense, in other words, counterclockwise, and it is now denoted as A rotated, as shown in figure 2.6. Okay, so there was the original vector A, we rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, and this now yields A rotated. The components of A rotated, in terms of the components of the original vector A, are minus A2, in other words, minus the Y component, um, and the X component. Okay, so, and that's exactly what we have. Um, over here. Yeah, that's exactly what we have over here. So if you look at the components of the original vector SA1, uh, the S rotated components is minus the Y component of the original vector in the X position and the X component of the original vector in the Y position. Okay. Now, um, the, and as I said, once again, you'll just bear with us, you'll see in a little bit why we do it in this elaborate manner. The array of reaction forces in equation 1 
can be expressed in another form. Okay, so we can rewrite it in this form, and then we get, um, if you look at the right hand side, now this coefficient matrix, which consists of minus the identity matrix, minus S rotated A1 transposed, uh, that coefficient matrix of the reaction force is the transpose of the revolute joint constraint Jacobian matrix. Okay, and that Jaco constraint Jacobian matrix is explained in the next um, bullet point body coordinate formulation. Um, and it's also explained in planar multibody dynamics chapter 7. And as I said, just bear with me. Uh, in the next bullet point, we will uh, you will see how everything ties together. Just bear with me. Okay. Okay, so let's now look at the analysis of the pendulum rod according to Nikravesh's body coordinate formulation. It's also explained in full detail in Planar Multibody Dynamics, Chapter 7. Okay, so... For our pendulum rod, which is the example we are we selected to describe and explain uh, this body coordinate formulation that Prof. Nikravis developed, um, that multi-body dynamic system has a revolute joint, a single body and a revolute joint. So it makes sense for us to now look at a revolute joint in a bit more detail. Now. Constraint equations for a revolute joint in the body coordinate formulation can be constructed very easily. Now as shown in figure 7.3a, that's also shown here on the screen, for a pin joint to exist between points PI and PJ on bodies I and J, their X and Y coordinates must be equal. Okay, and that is the vector RJP, shown here at the bottom, must be equal to the geometric vector RIP or RPI, depending on how you want to express it. The point is these two geometric vectors must be exactly the same. If they are equal to each other, um, then we can say that um, the pin joint is the pin joint is not violated. The pin joint is um, adhere to. All right. So therefore, the constraint equation for a pin joint is expressed here in equation 714. Now, in our case, for the pendulum rod connected to ground, hence this equation 714 becomes um, phi R2, okay, and that R represents revolute joint. 2 is the degrees of freedom that is removed or constrained by this joint. Okay, and in, in general cases, it will be RIP minus RJP. Okay, in our case, with the pendulum rod connected to ground, um, equation 714 becomes 0 minus RJP, or if we want to relate that expression to figure 2, okay, we can write that the constraint equation for this revolute joint is simply equal to 0 minus RA1 equals 0, okay. Now, and this is what I just mentioned earlier, the left superscript R is for revolute, and 2 denotes the number of algebraic conditions introduced by this joint. That, that's another way of saying that's the number of degrees of freedom that is removed by this joint. Or, it is um, uh, the number of constraints. Okay? That's also a simpler way of expressing it. Um, the long way is to say it denotes the number of algebraic conditions introduced by this joint. All right. Okay, very simple. Now, to have a better understanding on how the coordinates of bodies 
I and J have become dependent on each other through this kinematic joint. We use equation 3.10 to express 3.17 in matrix form as shown here. Okay, so just to uh, elaborate a little bit, this uh, equation 3.10 is shown here as well. Okay, in algebraic form. Uh, well, let's just have a look. I, I did explain it in detail over here. So equation 3.10 is derived by considering figure 3.5 okay so now as shown in figure 3.5 the vector sp is defined on a body to locate to locate point p from the body's origin okay so the components of this vector sp in the C eta and x, y frames are denoted as follows. Okay, so um, SP in the C eta reference frame is indicated here as S uh, with a stripe through it, P, and that is obviously now um, this component of here, SP C and SP eta. Okay, or we can say it, it equals this, what is indicated here in figure 3.5 as CP and eta P. Okay, those are the components of um, vector SP in the C eta coordinate system. And similarly, it's easy to see that vector SP in um, the global coordinate system is indicated by S superscript PX and S superscript PY. Okay, so that's indicated here uh, geometrically uh, on this graph. All right. Now, um, the C eta and x y components are related through what is called a transformation matrix A. Right, so we can say S P equals the transformation matrix multiplied by the local coordinates of uh, vector P. Now the x y coordinates of point P are found from the, either of the following vector relations. We can say that RP, RP is not indicated over here, okay? But this, if you were to, write, to draw in a straight line from the origin to point P, we can say RP is simply equal to R plus SP, okay? Or we can say, if we now substitute this expression 3.8, we can say RP in other words, the vector from the origin to point P equals the vector from the origin to the origin of the local coordinate system in this body, R, okay, plus the transformation matrix multiplied by the local coordinates of point P, okay, and this is now expressed or in expanded form in equation 3.10. Okay, that's where equation 3.10 comes from. Okay, and now what they have done here is they've used um, yeah, so expression or equation 3.10 is an actual fact uh, substituted in two places in this equation okay so we have um, x the the coordinates of the um, body i the x and y components of the of the position of body i and then we've got this transformation matrix of body i and we've got the C and eta components 
of point P in body I. Okay, and here we've got the X and Y coordinates of body J. We subtract that and we subtract this is the transformation matrix of body J multiplied by the local coordinates of point P in body J and that must be equal to zero in both cases or for the X and Y components okay so if we now look at the matrix form of equation 7.14 as applied to the pendulum rod okay so it will become minus X1 Y1 minus the transformation matrix of body 1 multiplied by the local coordinates of point A in body 1 equals 0, 0. Okay, maybe let me just do this quickly. Yeah, oh, this will make better sense then. So, it is minus x1, y1, the, the global coordinates of the center of gravity of body 1, which is the pendulum rod, minus the transformation matrix of body 1, multiplied by the local coordinates of point A in body 1, equals 0, 0. Right. Okay, so enforcing these conditions forms a pin joint between two bodies, as shown in figure 7.3b. It is not a problem that in our case with the pendulum rod, vector RA1 cannot be depicted, okay, as you, as you can see in, in figure 1, okay, this vector RA1 is a zero vector, but it's not a problem because uh, what we do is we take the vector originating from the origin and leading to the center of gravity of body 1 and we subtract the vector originating from the C of G of body 1 and terminating at this point. Okay, so it's not a problem that that's the case in our example. Okay, so the two constraints in equation 7.14 which is now derived for the general case of a revolute joint between two bodies those two constraints reduce the degree of freedom or the degrees of freedom between the two bodies by two. Okay, here is 7.14 once again. Now, this remains true for our pendulum rod with uh, where equation 7.14 uh, reduces to what we see on the screen here. Okay, we only have minus R A1 equals 0. Okay, now using equation 7.9, the velocity constraints for a revolute joint are obtained from the time derivative of equation 7.14 as follows. Okay, and this is shown here at the bottom. Okay, now equation 7.9 is proven in planar multibody dynamics section 3.2.2 for those of you who are interested this is equation 7.9 where we have the time derivative of the algebraic vector rp that's equal to the time derivative of r plus the time derivative of sp and we can express it in this form r the time derivative of vector r plus S rotated, if you remember what we spoke about earlier, P multiplied by phi dot. Now, for our pendulum rod, it follows that the general equation for the velocity constraints can be rewritten as follows. Okay, so um, this is now this expression on the left as applied to our pendulum rod which has a single body connected to ground with a revolute joint okay so we can write it in this form and here we've got um, uh, I just want to emphasize we also have the S rotated uh, vector that we see here in expression 7.9 as well as in this expression shown on the left so what we now can do is we can rewrite the above equation this one on the 
on the right hand side here as shown here in expression 715 okay and for our pendulum rod equation 715 reduces to simply the only the the right hand side and the lower side okay so we've got minus identity matrix minus s rotated a1 r1 dot and phi1 dot okay now from these velocity constraints we extract the jacobian matrix if you remember we spoke about the jacobian matrix expressed in two separate sub matrices as di uh, i'm not going to read them out uh, you can see these two uh, sub matrices shown here in expression 716 and just once again so we have the identity matrix and the rotated matrix of point P um, of both the, of that of uh, body I and body J. Now, um, so for our pendulum rod, um, we only have a single uh, Jacobian sub matrix. We can express it here as shown here. So D1 R2 is minus the identity matrix minus s rotated a1 okay and now what i've got here is a link back to what we spoke about earlier where we said the coefficient matrix minus i minus identity matrix minus s rotated transpose a1 of the reaction force is the transpose of the revolute joint constraint Jacobian matrix as we've just shown. So the importance of this and the significance of this is once we've got the Jacobian matrix of a specific joint we have this coefficient matrix in the array of reaction forces uh, and then we can obviously solve the equations of motions to get the reaction forces so the jacobian matrix is very important in the body coordinate formulation technique that prof nikravesh developed okay and this holds true for all the different types of joints that you can uh, define or specified for a planar multi-body system and that we will show and that we will see um, as we progress with subsequent examples okay so that was the velocity so now the time derivative of equation 715 yields the acceleration constraints okay and this is simply a matter of uh, algebra really okay so we we once again have the same uh, jacobian sub matrices now we've got the array of accelerations and we have now plus this additional term here on the right which consists of the rotation matrix of oh sorry uh, the ro rotated vector sp in i time derivative and on the right hand side the rotated vector spj minus okay and here we've got the velocity array of velocities okay so we can write the above equation as jacobian matrix acceleration array and um, these two terms on the right hand side now for our pendulum rod equation 717 simply becomes um, the jacobian matrix for body one um, the accelerations of body 1 minus S, the rotated vector S A1 time derivative multiplied by the angular velocity of body 1. Okay, so all the terms with uh, related to body I in equation 717 is eliminated because body I in our case is ground and body J in our case is body 1 okay so and point P is point A so very simple very straightforward 
So if we move these terms to the right hand side of the equation, we can say that the right hand side of the acceleration constraints for a revolute joint is given here by expression 7.18. And we, uh, we name that, or we identify the right hand side of the accelerations as gamma. Okay, so for our pendulum rod, equation 7.18, once again, we eliminate the I terms, and uh, body J is uh, body 1 in our case, which is the pendulum rod, and point P is point A. So very simple. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the, the, our discussion of a revolute or pin joint. Okay. Um, so, if you remember, we are still busy discussing the analysis of the pendulum rod according to Nikravesh's body coordinate formulation, which is dealt with in detail in Chapter 7 of his textbook, Planar Multibody Dynamics. So, to tie everything together, um, let us now look at the constrained equations of motions, the, of motion rather. These equations are... Um, solved inside uh, Nikravesh's MATLAB algorithm. Okay, so to start our discussion, with the presence of kinematic joints, okay, and in the, our case it is only one kinematic joint, namely the revolute or pin joint, we must consider the dependency of the coordinates, velocities and accelerations through equations 750, 751, and 752. Okay, so these are the constraint equations for our multi-body system. These are the velocity constraints. If we take the time derivative of equation 750, and if we take the time derivative of 751, we get the acceleration constraint equations. Okay, so, so just to make things clear, uh, for our pendulum rod, equation 750 simplifies as follows. Right, so we've already discussed this, uh, the constraint equations consisting of simply minus vector R A1, okay, and uh, here you can see the constraint equations is obviously dependent on the coordinates of our multi-body system, which only has one body, uh, which is also numbered as body 1. So that's why C in our case is X1, Y1, and Phi1. Okay, so we can say that um, our constraint equations equals the X and Y coordinates of body 1 minus the global components of vector SA1, X and Y, and that's equal to 0. Okay, so this just shows you the fact that um, the constraint equations is indeed a function of um, the coordinates. Okay, x1, y1, phi1. Okay, so equation 751, as I said, is the time derivative of the position constraints yield the velocity constraint equations. Okay, and for our pendulum rod, equation 751 simplifies to what you see on the screen over here. Um, where um, this identity matrix is a 2x2 two two matrix, S rotated A1, um, we've also discussed previously, and what you see on the screen is um, the, are the components of that S rotated A1 vector, or array if you like, um, the time derivative of 751, yields the acceleration constraint equations um, and for our pendulum rod 752 simplifies to what you see on the screen over here okay and just to elaborate a little bit further we once again have the 2x2 two two identity matrix we also have um, S rotated 1 oh, sorry S a1 rotated um, as before uh, we have this zero uh, matrix which is also a 2x2 two two matrix and then we have S 
um, a one rotated dot the important thing to notice is that there is a dependency of these equations on each other the accelerations of the body will obviously influence or the accelerations of the mechanism in our case it's only a single body the accelerations will have a direct impact on the velocities will influence the velocities and the velocities will obviously influence the position so these equations are dependent on each other okay so with that said furthermore for a system of constrained bodies the equations of motion must contain the reaction forces associated with the kinematic joints so these reaction forces are included in the equations of motion as superscript R for reaction forces a bold H okay while the applied external forces are included in the equation of motion as superscript A for applied forces bold H okay and that is shown here in equation 7.53 now for our pendulum rod, equation 7.53 can be expanded as follows. Okay, so we've got the mass matrix or the inertia matrix here. We've got C double dot, the array of centroidal accelerations. Uh, we've got the applied force. In our case, it's only weight. So that's why it's minus 19,62 in the y direction. And then we've got the reaction forces uh, given as minus lambda 1, minus lambda 2, and this is the moment. Okay, and if you remember, if I can just zoom out, this is exactly the same as equation 1, which we derived here for the free body diagram. Or we, we actually derived this equation, these equations of motion, using the free body diagram approach okay so it correlates exactly to what we said before now um, so the point here is that in general or in, in any case for our um, single uh, pendulum rod we don't know what those reaction forces are we also don't know what the accelerations are at time t0 we will know what the initial positions are and what the initial velocities are but we don't know the accelerations and we also don't know the reaction forces the applied forces we know we know its weight and we we know the value and the inertia uh, matrix we also know all right so for a constrained for a constrained multi-body system the complete set of equations of motion must be considered as equation 750 through 753. Okay, so it's these three equations that I've shown here before. The constraint equation, the positional constraints, the velocity constraints, acceleration constraints, as well as our equations of motion. Okay. So, we need to consider all those equations uh, for solving, for, uh, yes, for solving or for completing a dynamic analysis on this multi-body system. Okay, so, to, to explain that further, we note that if there are in subscript C independent constraints in equation 750 the number of degrees of freedom of the system is three times the number of body minus the number of independent constraints all right so let's see for our pendulum rod we know that there are two independent constraints for the pin or revolute joint Hence, our number of degrees of freedom is 3 times 1, there's only one body, minus 2, and that is 1. And we know that for the pendulum rod, uh, it is a single degree of freedom system. Okay, 
So knowing the coordinates and velocities of a system at any given time, the following can be evaluated. The constraints of equation 750, the Jacobian matrix, the array D dot C dot, and the array of applied forces. Okay. Now, the arrays that need to be determined numerically are the array of accelerations and the array of the reaction forces. Okay, so that's what I said earlier, and that's just a confirmation um, of the facts that we are facing doing this multi body dynamic analysis. Now, in the body coordinate formulation, a systematic process can be followed to construct the array of reaction forces. The development the, or sorry, the developed systematic process can enable a computer program to automatically construct the complete set of equations of motion for a multi-body system. This is actually well this is indeed what we want for a general purpose uh, multi-body uh, analysis program or algorithm. Now the array of reaction forces can be described in a, in a different form by the method of Lagrange multipliers and that's borrowed from the optimization theory and is shown here in equation 754. Okay, so for our just before we look at the pendulum rod D is the system Jacobian matrix as in equation 751 and 752 the velocity constraints and acceleration constraints and lambda is the array of coefficients known as the Lagrange multipliers the number of multipliers that is the dimension of array lambda is equal to the number of constraints or the number of rows in D okay and if you, but we'll look at the pendulum rod in a minute. In other words, for each constraint, there is a single Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so let's just tie that up for our pendulum rod. Equation 754, if I can just scroll a bit to the right, is simply um, the, the a transpose of the Jacobian matrix multiplied by the two Lagrange multipliers that we are aware of. Okay. Now, the immediate advantage of describing the array of reaction forces as the transpose of the Jacobian multiplied by the Lagrange multipliers is that the number of elements in the unknown array of reaction forces is three times the number of bodies all right that's the number of unknowns but the number of unknown multipliers in the array lambda is equal to the number of constraints where the number of constraints is less than um, three times the number of bodies that is we have reduced the number of unknowns in the equations of motion Okay, so for our pendulum rod, the number of elements in the reaction array of reaction forces is 3. Okay, that's the number of unknowns. But the number of unknown multipliers in the array lambda is only 2. That is, we indeed have reduced the number of unknowns in the equations of motion. Okay. So... With the new representation of the array of reaction forces, equation 753 is now expressed as shown here in equation 755. Now for our pendulum rod, equation 755 can be rewritten as, let me just zoom out a little bit. Okay, so we've got the mass or inertia matrix. We've got the array of centroidal accelerations. That equals the applied forces plus now it's the transpose of the Jacobian matrix multiplied by the two Lagrange multipliers okay and this actually clearly or illustrates now what we just explained in words over here so accelerations are unknown 
the inertia or mass matrix is a known matrix. The applied forces are known. Um, our obviously the two by two identity matrix is is a known matrix, and this transpose of the array S A one rotated is also known. Okay, so the only unknowns are the uh, Lagrange multipliers, right? So Lagrange multipliers and the accelerations; those are the unknowns. The rest of the terms in this equation are all known. Now, to solve these equations of to solve these equations for the unknown accelerations and Lagrange multipliers, we append equation 752 to 755 to form the following set of equations. All right. So that's given by equation 756 and let's just have a look for our pendulum rod. Let's just show what it looks like. So we've got the mass or inertia matrix. We've got um, we know the Jacobian matrix so we can easily find the negative of the transpose of the Jacobian and that is a 3 by 2 matrix okay um, the Jacobian as such is a 2 by 3 matrix okay this 0 matrix over here is a 2 by 2 matrix um, so what we've done now is we've listed or we've rearranged the expression so that all the unknowns are in a single array right and the right hand side of equation 756 is given over here so that's the applied forces and um, the time derivative negative time derivative of the Jacobian multiplied by the array of uh, centroidal velocities okay and this um, is a one rotated dot is simply the components are shown over here um, these are known values because at because we know what the in, uh, current time step velocities are okay but don't worry too much about that because further detailed discussion on solving these equations of motion or these equations rather either as an inverse dynamic analysis or as a forward dynamic analysis is left for chapters 12 and 13 and that is something that we will discuss in our next lecture. Thank you very much for watching.